Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Packed room. This is awesome. My first time at DevOps. Um, so I'm super excited to be here. Uh, quick show of hands. Who's doing REST in here? Who's building REST APIs? All of you, right? And who's already building gRPC APIs? Not so many. So I hope by the end of this session, I want to see more hands, right? So that I convinced you that maybe we should change building how we build APIs and we should change the technology we, we use for that. So who am I? I'm Leander. Um, this is uh, my long journey I had here. Uh, I live at the south of Germany in good old Bavaria, nice countryside. Austria, Austrian border is not that far away. Luckily, I didn't walk here, otherwise it would have been 218 hours according to Google Maps. So I took the plane, it only took two hours, uh, that was definitely a smarter choice. So nowadays I'm a principal software architect, so don't be fooled by my hoodie. Okay, it says management, but this is just to always, you know, make fun of some of my colleagues. So I'm a techie. Um, I'm a principal software architect working for Kuaware. We're a small, medium-sized uh, pro software project house, right, building custom software for, at the moment, large German enterprises. My projects are mostly for that big car manufacturer that has its headquarter in Munich with the three letters. Right? You know which one I mean? Yes? Okay. So I build systems there that usually run in the workshops, um, you know, of that manufacturer. Uh, right. So let's get started because we have 49 minutes left and I have a lot of stuff to show you. So this is what we're going to build. Right? We have loads of microservices. And because I like beer, I'm German, I think the British people also like beer, so we're on the same boat here. So we start with a good old REST service with a beer API, okay? You can curry for a list of beers, um, and obviously we have an application JSON endpoint. So the first thing I will then show you is how you can exchange the payload format, and maybe you should consider, you know, throwing away JSON um, and sticking in a, a protocol buffer serialization instead, right? So this is the first demo. Then we leave that aside, um, then we build the middle part, we build the gRPC beer service, I have two possible demos for you. The one is Quarkus, the one is Micronaut um, as a framework that have really good support for gRPC. Um, I show you how you can interact with that gRPC interface using command line interface. I have a small web UI that we can use um, to interact uh, with our B service. And once we've done that, we'll um, extend that demo and I'm going to show you how you can generate a matching REST API for our gRPC beer service. And you only have to write a bit of Go code, right? Um, maybe 50 lines, the rest can be generated. I show you how you can write TypeScript um, and you can interact with your gRPC um, service, um, uh, well, calling from JavaScript, TypeScript using the gRPC web protocol, also nice. And if we have time, I show you how you can build a small load balancer using Nginx, for example. So that's a lot of stuff. Um, of course, I uh, do have a small demo, and the first thing we do is, well, let's spin that stuff, uh, stuff up. So we do tilt up. So we let that run in the background. So what that does is, you know, it's building all the images, it's deploying everything, it's watching for changes. Um, I have a small local uh, Rancher desktop uh, cluster running on my laptop. Um, and if we go here, um, we should see that things are spinning up. Everything's green, as you see here. So this is how I think you should be developing, um, you know, microservices locally um, have tilt or scaffold, for example, to spin up everything um, nice and easily for us. All right. So that takes a while, maybe 30 seconds. Um, let's briefly go back to the slides. If you want to follow along, um, go here. Um, this is all the code I will show you, right? It's all on my GitHub repository, MIT licensed, copy, fork, feel free to use it, feel free to get inspired by, you know, um, by the code you find here. So different demos, if you're more on the Go side, right, there is also a pure Go implementation in, inside the rep repository. And as I said, Quarkus and Micronaut, depending which world you're in, um, is also there. Now I want to start with that quote, one cannot not communicate. That's Paul Watzlawick, 
Austrian philosopher, maybe known, maybe not known. He had five axioms about, you know, um, well, human communication. That's the first one. And what, what he's saying with this is basically, even, even though you don't speak, you are probably still communicating via, you know, your, your, your mimics or your gestures or something. Now, obviously, this talk is about computer science. And I think the systems we're building and the systems we've always built for the last, I don't know, 20 years, right? Um, they need to communicate, right? There is no system that is able to work on its own, right? You always have some form of communication, talking to backends, talking to an SAP backend, talking to some SOAP backends, whatever, right? So most of the systems we're dealing with nowadays are distributed systems, and the nature of a distributed system is that these things that are distributed need to talk to each other, right? Now, inter-process communication, or IPC in short, right, um, has gone come a long way, right? So the first proposal for RPC, something called Remote Procedure Call, that is from 1976. I wasn't even born back then, right? One year later, I'm 45 now this year. So 77, so one year earlier, RPC came. The first working implementation was 1983, right? Um, so 1983, right? This is ages in computer science, right? We were able to communicate between services. Well, that was mostly C, but 83, we had this first RPC implementation working. Corba 1.0, 1991. Now, I want to see the old guys. Who's worked with Corba in his life? <laughs> you see the beard. <laughs> so, um, well, you're not as great as I am, but, uh, but you worked with Corba? You still work with Corba? No. <laughs> But Corba was okay, right? I mean, they had, a, they had a good idea. They had something called an interface definition language. In that interface definition language, you could specify your services, you could specify your payloads. Out of that IDL, you had loads of compilers that then would generate code for you, generate service stuff, skeletons, clients in all different supported languages, right? Java, C, C++, other languages as well. Now, HTTP 1.0 came along in 1996, right? So, also rather old. Corba 2.0, 1996. I used that during my computer science studies, for example. This is when I studied computer science in 1996. DCOM, where the Windows guys? Anyone use DCOM? DCOM? Oh, there's one hand, two hands. Um, oh, that was gruesome, right? DCOM was gruesome. Oh. Uh, Java RMI, good old Java RMI, right? JDK 1.1 in 1997. Um, anyone still arm on the RMI side? One hand, yes. Well, it's, well, it used to work, right? It wasn't that bad. XML RPC, so another notion of, you know, how you can, uh, you know, represent a remote procedure call uh, using XML and send that over the wire. I mean, no one is doing XML anymore. I think nowadays there is even a JSON RPC specification available, so, you know, you can throw XML away and you stick JSON in and uh, you pretty much have the same. You know, Corba 2.3, HTTP 1.1. Then at some point, you know, this seminal moment, 2000, uh, uh, Roy T. Fieldings had his uh, master thesis working, um, well, writing on REST. And Corba came along, SOAP 1.2 came along. And then at some point, 2014 maybe, we decided, hey, that REST thing is maybe not such a bad idea. Let's start building systems with REST, or uh, communicating via REST. HTTP 2.0, and finally, we have gRPC, right? So gRPC, also pretty mature in my opinion, August 2016, version 1.0. Well, we have uh, 2022 now, so, you know, six years for a technology is uh, rather old. So, many options on inter-process communication. Now, let's talk about this REST thing, right? What's good with REST and maybe what's not so good with REST. Now, this is REST APIs, like we know them, right? Uh, two weeks ago, I've been at the Jay on the Beach conference in Spain. Uh, Hadi Hadiri had a good session there, a good rant about REST. Um, and what he said is, what is REST all about? It's pretty URLs with JSON payloads. That was his summary on REST. So we have those verbs there, right? Get, post, get, put, delete, patch, options, head. So all those HTTP verbs. What we usually do, we have some nouns in the URL describing our resources. You know, these identify our resources. If I want to get a specific beer, I need to know this one number, for example, or the name or something to then, you know, get a specific beer. Up there, we have the request. Also pretty easy to get a specific beer, right? We, we um, specify the accept header, application JSON, so that the server knows what to send us. Uh, maybe we also tell the server to gzip or deflate that stuff, um, right? Um, and this here is the response, right? HTTP 1.1 response, status code 200. And you see 
pretty Jason down there, right? So this is one of my most favorite beers. It's a Munich brewery. Um, so if you're in Munich, um, make sure to have at least one pint of that one. So in theory, uh, nice, right? You know, pretty girls, um, nice Jason payloads. So what's wrong with this? Well, um, first up, I think if you have a use case that fit, fits into this resource-oriented type thing, you know, maybe there's not so much wrong with it. But the reality often looks very different. Um, you probably heard of that one here, the Richard and West Maturity Model, that tries to, well, um, put a, a REST API and the evolution of a REST API onto those, uh, you know, three levels. Down at the bottom, level zero, you have that swamp of pox, so, you know, plain old XML. So this is basically SOAP, right? You have an endpoint. With that endpoint, you basically always do post. Um, you have some endpoint, which is called booking service, and then you send over XML structures and, you, you know, you do your RPC. If you evolve that one into more RESTful type things, then you start to introduce resources, right? So you stop talking about booking services, you st start uh, talking about bookings or beers or something. But you see here, level zero is still doing a post request, and you still have some form of XML or JSON um, um, request description that you send over. So on level two, um, well, you start using the HTTP verbs properly, and also the HTTP status codes, like 200, 404, you know, 500, 401, whatever, um, to express errors with the status codes. And here you have like get bookings, you have an ID, you maybe use some query parameters for the GET request. Um, you say, uh, I accept application JSON, and so on and so forth. And last but not you, least, you have those level three hypermedia controls where you start to interlink those resources with each other um, using HTTP links. Now, has anyone seen a level three API out there in the wild? I haven't, not so far. It's super complex to build in the first place. And usually, in my opinion, um, no, no team I've seen out there bothers, really. And most of the stuff I see is somewhere stuck between level one and level two, right? Um, because resources sometimes don't fit. What if you have an actual RPC use case, right? Then people start to, to, to press this RPC use case onto, onto this restful thing, but then it's all post again, and it's all strange JSON structures, super bloaty. Um, so I think REST is often abused for proper RPC use cases. I want to do something, I want to call something at the other side, process something, calculate something, right? Um, and not get me a resource. And then those REST APIs start to, well, they start to be a bit smelly, right? And you're stuck somewhere between uh, level one and two. Now, what I often hear from developers is, why do you do REST? And the most given answer is, well, it's so super easy to write. I want readability of my, of my API. I can open my browser and I do a GET request on the URL, and then I have a nice, pretty JSON, and it's super readable, right? JSON is not readable, right? A book is readable, right? And um, this one here, I don't know if you know about ISO 2510. You know, I'm a part-time lecturer at a university on software quality assurance, so this here is a, is a slide I borrowed from my, from my material for the students, right? And guys, there is no readability in ISO, right? There is efficiency, for example, right? What we do want is an API that is, for example, efficient in the timing behavior, resource utilization, right? Um, so no readability here, so forget about that reading thing. The worst thing I've seen uh, out there in the world was a team, due to readability, what did they do? They came and said, like, hey, Leanna, our REST API is so slow. And then we diagnosed it and said, like, that's a 60K request, well, response. Why is it so big? Well, we pretty printed uh, and formatted the JSON, so they were sending loads of, you know, loads of spaces back then. So I said, well, who's doing that? Well, we did that for readability, right? Forget about the readability, use a proper tool, and then uh, gets the job done. And then you have those here, right? Um, so those ubiquitous eight policies of distributed computing, right? You know, network is reliable. We all know it isn't. There's always latency. You know, bandwidth is also not infinite. Uh, the network is also not secure. And topology does change. And there definitely is more than one administrator. And transport cost is also not zero. So all these things. Now, how does REST with uh, JSON payloads perform on this one? Well, first up, if you have a proper REST API, it's usually not the one call. 
that's done, right? So you have like you know beers, and maybe you need to do you need to do other calls, you know, to get even more data for a proper use case. So it's not the one call; it's usually like I don't know five, six, seven, ten calls. So the latency adds up uh, to get all those resources you need to implement your use case, right? Um, bandwidth, right? You want to be efficient on the wire, right? And also transport cost. Transport cost is kind of the time it takes to marshal and unmarshal your payloads, you know, from the wire. This is what they mean with um, transport cost. And also here, especially in a Java world, right? Those JSON mappers, like I don't know, Yasson or Jackson or whatever, they do an okay job, but they're not fast, right? They are actually pretty slow. So how can we improve of that? On that, well. Protocol buffers. I know I shouldn't have made a slide with so many dots, but this is kind of protocol buffers in a nutshell, okay? So think of protocol buffers like XML or JSON, just that it's smaller, faster, and easier, in my opinion. It's language neutral, it's platform neutral, and it's extensible, right? Um, it's an efficient binary format that allows you to, you know, serialize and unserialize, deserialize um, your data structures into a binary format. How do you define the data structures? Again, you have an IDL, an interface definition language. This is what you use to, you know, to define your structures. And then you have um, different ways of generating code out of that um, um, IDL definition for languages like Python or Java, Objective-C, Kotlin, Dart, Go, you name it, all supported. The cool thing about protocol buffers is it's, um, well, it's backwards and forwards compatibility, right? So uh, a new, Client can still deserialize, um, you know, old um, old payloads, for example, and the other way around, if you adhere to certain rules. Now, what does that look like? So this is basically what it looks like. Okay, so this is now my beer proto definition. Um, those options up there, what they do, they um, kind of are for the compiler, for the Java compiler. So I tell it, hey, please put the generated classes into that package, have the outer class name, which is beer protos, optimize for speed, please. Then you define your messages, right? And you have everything you need, right? You have strings, you have floats, you have enums, uh, you know, you have lists, you have hash maps. So every, every data structure you can think of to model, you know, a, a proper, um, your, to model your types properly. And then in a Java world, well, you either have a Maven plugin, or in this case here, it's a Gradle plugin, um, that is available there that lets you generate the Java code, in our case, um, from that IDL definition. Because in looking at, uh, you know, uh, code on a slide is pretty boring. We go here. I hope you can read that. So, big enough, right? So, let's have a quick look, for example, at the Micronaut um, case. So, what you usually do is, this is... This is the proto definition I just showed you. Okay, here's my beer message. This is all there is um, in the build Gradle file. Well, um, I am using here that um, that dependency. I need that one. Maybe I do it one a bit bigger, right? Oop. Like that, easier to read. So this is all you have to do. You type that one in, and if you go to, for example, the Micronaut, uh, you know, um, starter on the web, in your web browser, you, ju you, know, you just click those different dependencies. So getting started with Micronaut or Quarkus is rather easy with those starter projects that they provide. Um, down here, this is all I need to do is I invoke um, the Proto-C compiler in the given version, and that's pretty much it here on that side. So I can then, right, plug that into here, and what I'm doing here now is simply exchanging um, application JSON serialization marshalling with now a binary payload format like this one here. So if I do get bears with, the, with this actual content type application X proto buff here, for example, then Micronaut will make sure to use a protocol buffers a serialization to then serialize my POJO into uh, the binary format on the wire, right? Now, yes, what's on the wire now is not readable anymore, right? But um, I think there are tools out there, like you know, specific curl implementations, that can then make sense of that binary format again. Now, if you're interested in, well, why should I care? Why should I bother? Well, this here, I think, is why you should care and bother, right? JSON versus protobuf performance, right? 
please, the disclaimer, okay? If you don't trust those, those figures, um, do your own benchmark. It's usually better, right? Don't trust me. Don't trust the internet. But I think there are many, many, many um, uh, you know, performance benchmarks out there that you can have a look and you can choose which one you trust. So protobuf on a non-compressed environment, right, is about five times faster. Right? And in a, in a compressed environment, it's almost six times faster, right? And if you're in a high-performance environment, if you have microservices serving, you know, hundreds of requests per second, I think it does make it different if the marshalling ta takes 25 milliseconds or it takes 150 milliseconds, okay? This is, this is serious time, I, I, I would say, right? So if you are not ready yet to go down the gRPC route, which we go, will go down in about one minute, then maybe you should consider at least using an efficient on-the-wire format like protocol buffers, throw JSON away, stick protobuf in, and uh, you at least have that performance gain um, you see here. Okay, so now um, we leave that aside um, and we say, well, what does gRPC actually look like? Is it, is it more difficult to implement the gRPC uh, you know, API than it is to implement the REST API with those given frameworks? And I hope to show you that it's not, definitely not the case, right? It's equally simple. So again, a slide with many bullet points. Um, so what is gRPC all about, right? So if you look on the web page, they say something about we are a modern, high-performance, open-source, universal RPC framework. So this is what the gRPC guys actually say on their things. So the first big change is it uses HTTP2 um, as a transport protocol, okay? And with HTTP2 come a lot of benefits. First up, you have multiplexing of connections, right? So this makes HTTP more efficient, right? And it makes it also more performant because you can reuse that one connection for, for multiple calls. TLS and compression in build, right? So also I would say these are two features um, in a modern world in 2022 that are, uh, you know, super important. Um, next cool thing, it supports several types of communication, right? So you have that classical, uh, you know, request response like you have in REST, obviously. But what you can also do is you can have either streaming uh, clients and serv services from the client side, from the server side, and also bidirectional, right? So there is no real distinction between the, who's the client and who's the server. Both can be, right? You can stream data, um, well, bidirectionally. Again, how do I define my services? I use the protobuf IDL to define my services and also the payloads. And guess what? If you have the IDL, you then have a matching compiler that will generate all the required server-side stops and also client stops for you that you can then use in your code, right? So again, code generation is your friend at that point. You don't have to write those technical glue code. Um, it supports various load balancing options. Proxy type load balancing, this is what I'll show you later. Client side load balancing, also look aside load balancing, where you have a separate uh, thing where you can look um, what are the registered instances. And it has flexible support to plug in tracing and health checks and authentication and all that sort of stuff, right? Um, this is what a gRPC service definition now looks like, right? So I have my service, I have my base service, I specify it's an RPC method, I give it a name, I specify the parameters on so this uh, type, you know, for the all beers, it's an empty, uh, empty request, uh, and I return the get beers response message. So this is all there is, and if we plug that into um, our, our code again, So here we go. Again, the default location, source main proto. Here is my proto definition. I've extended that one with now my beer service definition. Um, the integration into the build is already uh, nicely done um, by the generator from, from Micronaut, for example. But those are here the relevant lines. Okay, so I have the proto C. And now I specify the plugin I want. And I say, hey, I want the gRPC plugin. So please generate me even more code. So what that does is, in a Java world, um, generate an abstract base class that I can then extend from, right? So that class here, the base service input base, that is the class that has been generated. And all I then have to do, I extend from that class, I override um, all those you know, abstract methods, abstract empty methods, and I plug in my business code I need, right? So in that case here, for the all bears, I have a look at my super static 
map, hash map repository here where I have my three beers that are currently supported. Um, and all I do here is now I implement it, okay? So this is, in my opinion, super straightforward. Now, let's see how I can interact with that one. Now, I told you um, that there are tools out there. For example, this is open source. It's called gRPC curl, okay? So that's a, a specific curl-like implementation. I tell this gRPC curl, for example, hey, please use the following um, proto definition. My server is listening on, uh, you know, uh, 109090. Um, please invoke that, um, whoop, that service here, wait. Whoop. So the beer service all beers method. And what it also does is, Hey, it's nice and readable again, right? So even though this looks like JSON, obviously on the wire, that wasn't JSON, right? So on the wire, that was binary, right? Highly efficient, nice and small. But gRPC curl makes it nice and easy for me as a developer to work this, so I have my readability again, right? Ah, so all, the, all that readability. And if you don't like curl, what you can do alternatively is, well, Let's see if I can connect here. There's, for example, a project called gRPC OX. So it's a nice web UI you can also use. Again, I have to tell, uh, I, I have to give it the, the endpoint, which is running locally inside my small Kubernetes cluster. So I have the gRPC beer service listening on port 1990. I give it the proto definition. All oh, right, I can click here. I want the beer service. I want the, the all beers method. I submit this one and hey, here I have um, you know, my response again in five nanoseconds response time. So this is actually that fast. So maybe I want to create a beer or maybe I only want to get a single beer like that. Right, so working with it, I would say there are many tools out there that make it nice and convenient to even work with, you know, this um, uh, gRPC um, backend. All righty. Now, what else can I show you? Well, this was the Micronaut implementation. Any, any Quarkus guys here who likes Quarkus? Quarkus? A, a few hands? Well, I can show you the Quarkus implementation. And guess what? It doesn't look that much different, right? Uh, maybe the build integration, the build tool integration is slightly different. Um, but again, there is, for example, a nice Quarkus extension available, which is the Quarkus gRPC extension. If you do that, then that's all there is almost, right? Up here, you have the, the Quarkus plugin um, for this Gradle build here. And you see here, what's even more convenient, I don't even have to configure the Proto C plugin explicitly anymore like I did with Micronaut. Here, the Quarkus uh, plugin um, takes, takes over the job and does it. Again, I have my beer Proto in here. This is exactly the same implementation, so no changes here. And uh, guess what? The beer service implementation <laughs> is copy-pasted from the one implementation because also the implementation doesn't, doesn't really change. The only difference is that annotation here, right? So I have to tell Quarkus, hey, listen, this class is a gRPC beer service, uh, is a gRPC service. But the implementation itself is the same as we just seen with the, with the Micronaut implementation. And that's it, right? And I would argue, right, if you, if you compare this here, for example, this implementation with, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe the REST implementation, this is not much difference, right? If you, if you have a look at the REST implementation, where is it? Where is my beer resource? Here's my beer resource. This is what the REST implementation looks like, right? You had loads of annotations, all that. Um, so I would say the, the implementation is not that much different. Okay, then, what else is there? Now, obviously, um, I have that gRPC implementation now, and maybe the world out there is not quite ready yet for gRPC. So what do we do with all those REST fans and all those REST clients and all those other maybe external clients that still want to use REST, right? I mean, there is a place for REST, let's be fair. What I don't want to do is, I don't want to implement the REST interface. Now, what I will show you next is how you can now generate, 99% generate, a matching REST API for my gRPC backend. So that's one demo. 
As I said, I will also show you how we can write a bit of JavaS uh, JavaScript or TypeScript code and uh, let a JavaScript client, maybe your React front-end or your Angular front-end or whatever, let that not talk to REST endpoints, let it talk to your gRPC backend straight away. Using uh, a, a small, what you need for that is a small Envoy proxy plus a bit of code generation, and that also gets the job done. And again, what I show you is how you can write an HTTP2 load balancer uh, for, your, for your services. Now, this is where the gRPC ecosystems, uh, ecosystem now comes into play, right? So they have something called the gRPC Gateway subproject, which is the one that generates and provides the REST API for your gRPC services. They have a subproject called the gRPC Web project. This is like how you can let those uh, you know, web clients talk over the uh, gRPC Web Text protocol with your backend. And mainly it's supported by Nginx and Envoy, both are, are super um, you know, small reverse proxies that you can use um, to implement a load balancer. Now let's have a quick look at the gateway. Again, you have your IDL, and what you can now do with this gRPC uh, gateway plugin is you can specify additional options for all of your um, gRPC methods. And basically what you do in those options, you tell the compiler how that maps to an HTTP 1.1 REST API again, okay? So for the all BS method, what I'm telling him is, well, please use get. This will be an HTTP get request on the following URL. So this is kind of reverse engineering my REST API now again. For the get beer, for example, I say it's get, um, it's API beers, and please, the path parameter that comes after that URL, please map that to the matching field name of the request object, right? So the ASIN parameter is mapped to the get beer request as an um, parameter I show you in a, in a second in real code. Then. And the response body is basically take the beer field from the get beers response and marshal that to JSON in the response of that get request. For post, it's pretty similar, right? If you want to create beer, we want an HTTP post, API beers, just map all the fields from the body to the request object, and so on and so forth. So let's, for just completeness, what we can now do, we now go in our gateway. So this is what I just showed you on a slide, a bit more elaborate, right? So I do the same for update, right? Update is a put request. Again, that field, the ASIN field, if you have a look at the update beer request, this is here the ASIN, right? So take the path parameter from the get request or from the put or whatever request and put that into that field on that request here. And the body um, is um, beer, so map that one to, again, here to that update to that beer field here, okay? So this is kind of the mapping of what from the, uh, you know, from the HTTP request ends up in which message from the response or the request object. So that's all you have to do, right? You take the proto definition, you put in those extra options for each and every RPC method. Now, I told you, unfortunately, the, the gateway, um, the project currently only supports Go as a, as a language, right? I don't know if you're familiar with Go, but Go is not that much of a hard language. I think it's a pretty simple and easily readable and understandable object and uh, language. So what I now do is I use a project called Buff. Buff is a, a nice command line tool that helps you with all the, com you know, no one likes typing, right? And uh, what Buff basically does is, um, generate or invoke the proper plugins and, the, um, the, the, and drive the generation process. So this is basically it. I use the Go plugin, okay? I want to let um, this buff generate um, Go code. I need the Go RPC plugin. I need the gRPC gateway plugin. And as a matter of fact, what I can also tell it, hey, please uh, generate an open API v2 definition, unfortunately, at the moment. Um, no v3 yet, so I can also generate open API definitions. How does that work? Well, guess what? We go in our IDL, and this here is I specify even more options, and I tell it, hey, uh, please um, uh, generate the matching, you know, swagger definition in that case, um, using this information um, plus everything from the REST API. So you even get that generated, no, not handwritten. 
Then it's one command away. I do buff generate. Okay, super simple. And then I do go build. And the only Go code I have to write is this here. Okay, 50 line, 55 lines of code in this case. And the magic basically happens here, right? So all I do here is, right, I spin up that generated um, Go code. I spin up an HTTP endpoint at the, at, the, at the front end on a given port. This is what I do to serve like my REST API. And then what it basically does, it translates all, all the REST calls, all the HTTP calls, and then calls the backend, um, which is the gRPC backend. So let's see. Uh, where do I go? I, we do that one here. We do that. Now I have to think. What was the support? 90. Was it 1990? Uh, <laughs> demo. What was the port of my. of the gateway? Where's the port? Ah, this one here. Okay, here we go. So 1080.90 slash API slash beers, like that, okay? So this is now talking, is doing an HTTP get call, right? Maybe a bit bigger, right? Like that. And now it's definitely, right? Content type application JSON. But you see here that at least from those headers, you see that in the back end, I have definitely talked some form of gRPC, and if you, see, if you look closely here at the, at the top level, it is actually my gRPC beer service implementation that is responding um, to that get call, okay? So 55 lines of Go code plus a bit of generation magic for your gRPC interface definition, you can now generate a matching um, REST interface for that one. So I would say this is pretty neat. So what else there is? Well, um, the next demo is the gRPC web demo. Um, what we need for the gRPC web demo is one additional infrastructure component. And the infrastructure component currently supported is Envoy, right? Small cloud native um, proxy component used by many service meshes, uh, for example, or used under the hood by many API gateways out there. Um, so this project makes use of Envoy, and the magic is basically only that one line here, right? So you only have that one line um, where you say, where you enable the gRPC web filter. So let's have a look what that looks like. Um, so again, well, where is my beer Envoy? Okay, so this is the complete configuration file, nothing special. Here is the line I've just showed you. This enables uh, the gRPC web filter. And in the back end, you see that this envoy will forward every request internally inside the cluster to my gRPC beer service. So again, I need a small proxy component that does a bit of magic. So once you have that deployed, you can now start to write your JavaScript code. Again, I use this tool called buff. This is what the generator looks like. Okay, so this tells Buff to please use um, the JavaScript plugin. So please generate a bit of JavaScript plus generate the required code for the gRPC web client. So again, bit of YAML, bit of configuration. Um, on the command line, you then issue, uh, you know, you do Buff generate and Buff generate will generate all these files here. This, these files here is all, you know, is all generated code. So in my gRPC big client, this is, well, let's do that away. That is basically now the code you can write to interact with, well, to make calls against that gRPC web envoy instance. We just, you know, are built and deployed to our cluster. Up here, I now invoke, right? So the beer service client, this is generated code. What that one needs is where's the endpoint I want to talk to. And once I have that endpoint, I can now start to write some uh, JavaScript code to, for example, beer client, please invoke the all beers method and, you know, uh, and print the response uh, to the console. And the same is for the get beer request, right? So pretty straightforward um, and simple to interact with, um, you know, the endpoint. All right. Um, 
now let's see how how we can call that. So we open. We go here. I do my JavaScript. So here's the index HTML that loads the JavaScript. And now I have to open the tools, the developer tools, right? And up here, down here, you see the console. So every time I, I invoke that one here, right? So down here, I have now, for example, this is the response I got. So here I now have my Augustina uh, uh, beer again. Uh, maybe it is a bit bigger. So here, this is what my web client now, my, my TypeScript JavaScript client uh, received from the backend. Okay? So again, the Proto C compiler is your friend. If you are maybe in the, you know, more of a front end developer, this code you can plug into every, you know, Angular, React, whatever is your favorite. Um, let the generator generate the matching code. And now your front end component, your front end uh, application is able to interact with your gRPC backend straight away. So no need to do REST if you want, okay? This is still kind of experimental, the gRPC web stuff, but I think it gives a good impression um, what's, you know, what's possible out there. All right, so um, I hope I was able to convince you that uh, you know, the gRPC world has a lot to offer, right? Um, it's super well integrated into most Java backend frameworks, Helidon, Quarkus, Micronaut, you name it, it's all there. They all have um, a gRPC support. As far as I know, the microprofile guys are also working on, on a gRPC microprofile extension so that if you're more in the Jakarta world um, and with microprofile support, you also get that. So. Um, gRPC support is coming in the Java world, and with all those ecosystem components, um, it's also possible to write, if you still need REST, then you can have REST, use the gateway, let it connect uh, to your backend, to a gRPC backend. And if you ask myself, what's the, in my opinion, the best proof of concept, or no, no it's not even a proof of concept, I, this is the wrong word, right? Who does exactly that? REST on the outside world, gRPC on the inside world, which very popular component does exactly that. Kubernetes. Kubernetes, thank you, right? So I think if they do it and right, Kubernetes is rock solid, why shouldn't we use the same approach for the systems we are building, right? High performance, microservice to microservice communication using gRPC, and if you have this thing of interoperability with you know, other people out there um, that may not be able to talk gRPC, then have the REST gateway and you have best of both worlds. All right, then, quick look on the eight minutes left. So, if you have questions, now is the time. Thanks for listening. I need to take a picture of you. Great crowd. Thank you. <laughs> Well, it's using, on the wire, it's using TLS because it's HTTP2, right? So that is kind of the encryption on the, on, on the wire format. And if, what you're probably referring to is like a kind of authentication or authorization or something like that. Well, this is something you have, then have to build in, right? So may, you may do OIDC, for example, or that, that depends on, on the use case, right? Um, that's the best answer I can give you for the Spring world. To be honest, I'm not that much into the Spring community, so I ca can't tell you how to configure it there. Is that okay? Yeah, that's great. Okay. Anyone else? There's, there's one. Yeah. Can you repeat, please? Because I didn't, didn't hear that. But, well, yeah. Ah, that compatibility thing I was talking about, right? I mean, the rules are basically, um, as you've seen, what each, each and every, um, 
Where is a proto definition? Give me a second. Beer uh, source main proto this one here, for example, right? Each and every field gets an index, okay? So to make this compatibility thing working, basically what you should not do is, um, well, you can change the order, that doesn't really matter, but you always have to keep the index, right? Um, if you then start to extend your API, basically what you have to do is, you have to choose higher numbers, right? So don't use existing, don't use existing numbers, uh, don't rename fields, obviously, right? Um, so there are, oh, I can't get them, but there's three rules you have to adhere to. And if that then works, if you have an older client that talks to a newer server, right? I mean, basically, then the new server, if you stick to those rules, well, it can still unmarshal the, the old request, right? But what you then obviously have to implement is how do you deal with the fields that are missing, right? So this is basically implementation detail, wh wh how you make sense of that. You can fill it up with default values, for example, or something like that. I mean, it's pretty much the same in the REST world, right? If you do API versioning. Um, and the same is true if you have an older server talking to a new client, right? It pretty much ignores all the fields it doesn't, it doesn't know, right? So it uses, the f it uses just the information it understands. But again, it's up to your implementation to then make sense of it. Is that, does it answer your question? Uh, pretty much, yeah. So no magic there. Okay. Uh, and can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, do you approach API design differently when using RPC as compared to REST? Or do you still follow like a regular CRUD structure? I mean, Obviously, this was a pretty CRUD-type API to just make the REST thingy work, right? Um, but I, uh, I wouldn't say that you approach your, your API design any differently, because this is just the technology, the, the, the technical implementation of how you then implement it using gRPC. But uh, I would say if you, you know, if you, you come from a business perspective, you have your use case driven by that, you, you, you specify the messages you want to exchange between the client and the server, and then you, you, know, you know what to do, and then you write it down in the IDL, right? Um, but I think it's kind of contract first, right? Because without the IDL, you can't do anything. So you need to specify the IDL first. I don't know, do you write the open API v3 definition beforehand? Probably not, right? You let it generate by the code, the, the vice versa. So you implement code and then you let the definition uh, be generated. But I would, I would say you don't approach it any differently. It's just how you express it in, uh, in the, in the protobuf file. This is the different part. Okay, cool. Thanks. Oh, back there is one. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Um, what's the current state of the tooling for uh, contract-based testing around gRPC? Um, oh, that's an excellent question. Um, uh, I know that. What's it? Um, Pact. Pact as a contract-based testing yeah. uh, framework. They have recently added support for gRPC. Ah, awesome. Right. So you can use Pact if you if you want contract-based testing. And there are quite a few other tools out there where you kind of that allow you to. Um, to kind of lock and version your proto definitions and that find out if, you, if, you, if you've broken the contract, for example. So there are a few tools out there that make that you know, safe and easy to use. Awesome, thank you. Thanks. Hi. Um, when you start using some of the variant types, like any one-off, do things stay as nicely as, as, as you've shown or does it start to get tricky? Um, <laughs> good question. Uh, variant types. So what you can tell uh, gRPC, it's either that type or the other type, right? And you have union types, for example, as well. Um, if it starts to get tricky, I don't know. I've never used them so far. <laughs> so that's the honest answer. <laughs> yeah. But why you would probably use it, for example, if you, if you want to if you want to express errors, right? It's either the success response or it's the, it's the error message, right? This is why you would perhaps, would perhaps use it. Um, but if it, if it does get tricky, 
I don't know, but I don't think so, because in the Java API, then uh, you, you have the suitable API that lets you query, is it that or is it that? And then you can write, uh, uh, unmarshal the correct thing and, and, and use the correct thing. So there is an API that lets you ask, is it that type or is it that type? And then you, 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 you code against the, the generated um, you know, Java classes in that case. So I wouldn't say it does get tricky. All right. Well, technically there's one minute left, but we saved ourselves a minute. <laughs> Thanks a lot.